Thank you, ladies and gen gentlemen. I'm Jonathan Coleman, and I'm here today to tell you about some research that we've been doing recently, funded by the European Research Council and Science Foundation Ireland, and it's research into making state-of-the-art nano devices and sensors from nanomaterials using things that you can find in your kitchen and your office. And I mean that. We're going to use kitchen blenders, we're going to use inkjet printers, and we're going to use my favorite, rubber bands. And we're going to use those to do useful things. And there's a serious message here. I want to show you that nanoscience doesn't have to be complicated. It doesn't have to be high tech. It can be quite simple. And that's actually really important, because if we want nanoscience to solve some of the problems today and to, to create applications that are really useful and that will change society, it has to be simple. It can't be complicated. So that's what I want to talk to you today. So why nano? Why are we all so excited about nano? Well, scientists have known for a long time that if you make things small enough, they change. And in fact, if you make materials small in one dimension, to a size approaching one nanometer, the properties change often for the better. And one nanometer is one millionth of a millimeter. So this is really very small indeed. So probably the most common of all these nanomaterials is graphene. Now let's do a quick test. Hands up who has heard of graphene. OK, everyone has heard of graphene. My five-year-old five son has heard of graphene, although he would. So what is graphene? It's a one-atom-thick sheet of carbon. And you can see the structure there on the screen. It's in this sort of hexagonal chicken wire type form. And actually, you've all had some experience of graphene, because graphene is the building block of graphite. And graphite, of course, is found in pencils. And so the graphite that you find in your pencil is made up of just millions and millions of these sheets of graphene, so one atom thick sheets of carbon stacked on top of each other, just like a deck of cards. And that's all graphite is. So the first thing to take from this is that graphene is not a million miles away from everyday life. But the second critically important point to remember is that graphene, even though it's from graphite, is completely different from graphite. It has properties that are distinct from those of graphite. So let's have a look. So graphene, even though we've had experience of graphite for well over 500 years, graphene was only separated from graphite in 2004. And it, this was done in the University of Manchester, and they did it using sticky tape. So they take a piece of graphite, put sticky tape on it, peel off little bits of, of black stuff, stick them down on a surface, take the tape off again, and sometimes, sometimes, they would get graphene on that surface, one atom thick sheets of carbon. And when they studied that, those one atom thick sheets of carbon, they found that they had these wonderful properties, so all sorts of good things, strongest material known to man, etc. And because of that, the Nobel Prize was awarded in 2010. And actually, it gets better, because there's not just graphite. Graphite is one what we'd call layered material, because it's all these layers of graphene stacked on top of each other. But there are many. So there are two-dimensional materials where instead of carbon, as you have in graphene, you have other atoms. So an example, this is boron nitride. It's very similar to, to uh, graphite. It's like stacked sheets, but the sheets are made of boron and nitrogen and not carbon. There's molybdenum disulfide. Molybdenum disulfide is, again, it's a layered material made up of stacked, very, very thin sheets, except in this case, they're made of molybdenum and sulfur. And there are hundreds of these things. And the important point is that they're all different. So for example, graphene is an electrical conductor. Boron nitride is an electrical insulator. But molybdenum disulfide is a semiconductor. So you've got all different properties. And critically, those three properties, conductor, insulator, and semiconductor, those are the building blocks of electronics. So you can imagine putting these materials together to make complex electronic devices. So and you know, there are loads of applications you can think of. But the question is, how would you make this stuff? 
Well, we discovered in my lab in Trinity that you can take graphite and you can expose it to ultrasonic energy. And what you do in a liquid, and what you do is you blow all those sheets of graphene apart and you make millions of sheets of graphene. So I'm going to show you this. So up there, this is a beaker with a special liquid in it. And that metal thing sticking down is a probe that delivers ultrasonic energy. And all the black things are just pieces of powdered graphite that have been poured in there. So you turn on the ultrasound, and what happens is you'll see the, the liquid is going to start going dark as all the graphite is lifted off of the surface, and then it goes darker and darker as that graphite is turned into graphene. And after a while, now you can see it. It's black, and you've got millions and millions and millions of sheets of graphene. And this is a, a quite a good way of making graphene from graphite. But you can only do that in beakers. You can't do that at very, very large scales. So it's great for the lab, but it will never be used to make industrial-scale amounts of graphene. So how would we do that? So we, my group in, in Trinity were approached by an English chemical firm told, called Thomas Swan to scale up this process. So they wanted to be able to make very, very large quantities of graphene. And we worked on this project for, for quite some time, and eventually we developed large-scale industrial mixers to make loads of graphene, and this was patented and published and licensed to Thomas Swan, and this is now a product. But that's not what I want to talk to you, to, to you about today. I want to talk to you about making graphene in a kitchen blender. This is much more fun. So we went to the local high. We, we wanted a simplified version of the industrial scale mixer. And that just turns out to be a kitchen blender. So we went to the local high, st high street shop, and we bought this kitchen blender for $39.99. That's, that's a good price. And what you do is we wanted to keep things simple. So we took graphite, which we made from pencils. We take the lead out of the pencil, put it in there. You have to add a stabilizer, because when you make the graphene, it'll stick back together if you don't stabilize it. So we use soap. And the soap we used was fairy liquid, which is a common dishwashing liquid. It's great, because it washes your dishes, and it's kind to your hands as well, so it's fantastic. <laughs> and you put some water in the blender, you put the graphite in, you put the fairy liquid in, you turn it on, the liquid goes black, and then you look in with an electron microscope, and you see you've got loads of these clearly two-dimensional objects. And when you look with the, the atomic resolution electron microscope, you see it's graphene. It looks just like the structure. So it's, it's very, very nice. Now, you might say, I don't believe him. He, he, this couldn't be right. We're going to show you. So this is Keith. This is an engineer from Thomas Swan. And he's going to demonstrate this process. He So Keith, or Dr. Peyton, as I, t I call him when he's in trouble. So this is a pencil. This is an old graphite pencil. He's putting some graphite in. Actually, that would take too long. So here's some we prepared earlier. It's just powdered graphite. So it goes in the blender. So now we need, what, what's next? The water. The water comes next. You can see this is nothing special. This is water that we bought actually here in Brussels in the local shop. So this is half a liter of water. The water goes in. And then once we make the graphene to stop it sticking together, we need to add some stabilizer. And the stabilizer is fairy liquid. You can see this is really fairy liquid. I don't know what you use in Belgium, but this is what we use in Ireland. You can also use the stuff you buy in Aldi or Lidl. It works just as well. So just a few droplets, a really tiny amount of surfactant. Lid goes on. Blender goes on. You can see the liquid's going black. It's a bit grayish because of the bubbles. But in there, that has to run for a little while. And while it's running, let me tell you a little story. When we published this, we published this in Nature, and there was a lot of media attention. And a couple of weeks after, I was contacted by a Dutch professor that I know. And he said to me, you tried to kill my nine-year-old nephew. I said, I've never met your nine-year-old nephew. He said to me, he saw what you'd done. He got his granny's blender. He got some graphite, and he made graphene. And he rang me, and he said, Uncle Ton, I, you know, I've made graphene. What will I do with it? And Ton said, OK, well, you know, you put some paper in there. Here's a, here's a suggestion. Put some paper in. The paper will go black because it's coated with graphene. You dry it, and you've got electrically conducting paper. And then you can get a battery and a light bulb and connect it all up. The light will go on. The electricity is flowing through the paper. It's all good. An hour later, 
Ton's phone rang, and it was, Uncle Ton, the kitchen's on fire. <laughs> the kid couldn't find a battery, so he connected it to the mains electricity, and poof. So don't try this at home. OK, so in here, that's enough. In here, we've got half a liter of graphene-containing liquid. In that liquid, there are roughly three million, million sheets of graphene produced in, in that time. So I think that's pretty cool. And this is with a 39.99 Kenwood kitchen blender. Thanks, Keith. <laughs> so that's in a blender. Imagine what you can do in a big industrial scale mixer. OK, so what can you do? Once you have large quantities of graphene, you can make things that you never would have been able to make before. And this is my favorite example. This is not a pint of Guinness. That's graphene. The black stuff and the top stuff is boron nitride. It looks tasty, but you really wouldn't want to drink it. OK, so what else can you do? So we've got black liquids. Let's do something useful. So one thing that was quite fun was we took an inkjet printer, just standard inkjet printer. Well, we have a fancy one, but you can do it with normal ones. You take the ink cartridge, you take the ink out, you replace it with the black graphene-containing liquid, and then you can print the graphene as if it was an ink. And this is the Trinity College Dublin logo printed in graphene. And if you don't believe me, here's a scanning electron microscope uh, image, and you can see it's just millions of graphene sheets. So that's all very well. That's great fun. But what's, you know, what's really the point of that? Well, you can do other things. So here is an example where you see the black structures. That's where we've inkjet printed an interdigitated electrode array. And that's just two electrodes. And we've inkjetted inkjet printed from graphene, and graphene is, an, it, is a conductor. And then in the gap between the electrodes, we injected molybdenum disulfide, which I showed you earlier, which is a semiconductor. So what we have here is conductor, semiconductor, conductor. It's the basis of an electronic device. And when you shine light on that structure, the electrical resistance changes, as we've measured. So what we have here is a, a light detector, such as you'd find in a digital camera, for example, but it's made all by inkjet printing of nanomaterials made in a kitchen blender. And I think that's pretty cool. <laughs> but there's more. So these are rubber bands. These are normal rubber bands bought in the local shop for about a cent each. Now, these are made from natural rubber. And if you take natural rubber, and if you put it in certain liquids, the rubber swells. Pores are opened up in, inside the rubber. And the, the second photograph is of the rubber uh, band after three hours soaking, and you can see it's got bigger. It's doubled in size. Now, if you take that swollen rubber and you put it in the black graphene liquid, what happens is the graphene coats the surface of the rubber and goes into the pores, and you get a black rubber band that is now electrically conducting because of the graphene coating and the graphene that's inside it. So now we've got a rubber band that conducts electricity. So you might ask, why would we want a rubber band that conducts electricity? <laughs> the reason is that when you take that rubber band and you stretch it, the electrical resistance of the rubber band changes, and changes in a very well-defined way depending on how much you've stretched it. So as you're stretching it, if you monitor the electrical resistance, you can tell how far you've stretched it. So what you have is a sensor for position and motion. Now, you can get sensors for motion and position, but it turns out that this is one of the sensitive, most sensitive, stretchiest, fastest motion sensors that you can get. And there will be loads of applications, and I'll show you just one. So here is a student, and around his wrist he's, is the, the graphene-containing rubber band. And what we're going to do on the screen is a graph of the resistance of the band, and you can see that as he squeezes that squidgy thing in his hand, the resistance is changing, and so you can monitor very well the flexing of his, the muscle here in his arm. Now, this is just quite a simple demo, and I don't have time to show you any more detail, but what we've done, for example, is take these bands, and if you mount them on the student's chest cavity, you can actually monitor his breathing. And this is very, very important because there are certain things like, for example, cot death in babies, where babies stop breathing in the cot and they, they, they can die 
if you had a monitor of their breeding, you could have a warning for that. So there are many, many real life, this is not just fun, there are real life applications of these things. And these, these sort of rubber bands would be great simply because they're cheap and so they can be rolled out very widely. So I really like that. So is there anything else graphing can do? Or you might ask, is there anything graphing can't do? Well, one day I opened the newspaper and I saw this. How do you compete with that? <laughs> and if you read the article, you find out, well, actually, this is just referring to, to the Gates Foundation had given a grant to make graphene-enabled condoms. And I was quite, quite frustrated when I saw this because, actually, we had a drawer full of graphene-filled condoms. Because condoms are made of latex, not unlike rubber bands, and you can use the same treatment with the rubber bands to take a normal condom, and to fill it with graphene on the top or boron nitride on the bottom. And I think you know, being able to choose the color is, is a real selling point. <laughs> I, I think it's great. But really, though, there's a serious message here. And the serious message is that you know, once you have control over materials at the nanoscale, you can do lots and lots of things. And really, you know, there will be applications where you wouldn't imagine them. And for example, just a serious application of this, for example, you could put graphene into rubber gloves. So for example, to improve the barrier performance of rubber gloves, for example, for, for doctors treating Ebola. So there are really serious things here. So the moral of the story is that nanoscience doesn't have to be complicated. It doesn't have to be big and scary and expensive. It can be simple. It can be cheap. There are applications everywhere. You just have to think about them, and you'll only be limited by your imagination. And in the future, we will have many, many nano-enabled products. They will be all over the place. At first, nanomaterials such as graphene will replace existing materials. But in the future, the, ma the magical properties of nanomaterials will enable completely new applications that we can never even imagine now. And that is what's really exciting. So thank you.